Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 11 of the Future of Work show, where we discuss ideas with relevance for the future. For those of you who are joining us for the very first time, my name is Shalini. I'm a co-founder of Uncube, and I work at the intersection of people and organizations and the future of work. My colleague, Jaspreet Bindra, focuses on business and technology, and both of us are educators and advisors. Now for the topic of our show today, the future of robotics in India. Now, most of us have had many, many different experiences when we think about robots. Sometimes we are excited with anticipation for what that's going to mean for all of us. Sometimes we're inspired and sometimes we're also a little bit anxious. So to help us understand what the future of robotics in India looks like, we have the robot man himself, Mr. Rajiv Karwal, whom I'm just bringing on. Hi, Rajiv. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, Shalini. It is my pleasure. No, wonderful. For those of you who are new to Rajiv, Rajiv has had an extremely illustrious career through the consumer durables industry. He's worked in leadership roles in Oneida, Philips, Electrolux, LG, I think pretty much all the major consumer durable companies of that time. Before he started off as an entrepreneur, and in 2007, he founded Milagro, uh, which is uh, India's number one service robotics uh, organization. Uh, so my first question, Rajiv, is really an understanding of how has this journey been since 2007? You spent so many years uh, in the consumer durables industry. Was the journey into robotics as you expected, or were there many surprises along the way? Uh you know, so 2007 uh, to 2011, we were pretty much a consulting firm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the journey in the robotics field started around end of 2011 and maybe, you know, about a year of preparation before that. And, uh, you know, when 2011 end, we launched uh, the products and we had actually launched uh, the floor robots uh, first and then the other robots uh, came in later. The response was very, very good. Uh, you know, we launched through our own website. We launched with Flipkart at that time. Amazon wasn't there. And we quickly actually also brought in Chroma and, uh, you know, Vijay Sales and, you know, other uh, durable mm -hmm. retailers. And uh, we were surprised that demand even from smaller towns was coming. But it was basically the early adopters of uh, technology or robots, uh, you know. Uh, and then the demonetization happened. Uh, and thereafter, very quickly followed by GST, which was, uh, you know, we were put in the 28% category. Uh, robots wasn't a, uh, you know, essential purchase item. It was a discretionary purchase item, uh, you know, for the customers. And when, and most of these guys, while we used to sell officially, the people used to buy cash on delivery and things like that. And when cash finished, the sales fell through the dual, uh, you know, GST and demonetization blow by almost 70%. And at, wow. you know, there was a time when, you know, I kind of felt that, uh, you know, what's the point, you know, just, uh, just quit. Uh, but as I realized, you know, it is uh, never the idea which fails you. It is you who fail an idea. And an idea also has a time, you know, when it has to come or kind of move mainstream. Maybe we were early on uh, in the journey with slightly early than what uh, the market uh, had evolved. But last couple of months, uh, you know, unfortunately, it took a pandemic to bring robots mainstream. But we have seen massive growth, uh, you know, almost we have ourselves grown by 400 to 500 percent in the last couple of uh, months. And if supply chain constraints weren't there, uh, probably we would have grown much more. So it has been a roller coaster we have passed through the valley of death. And now I think we have, uh, we are on a strong wicket. Wow, that is amazing. I, I mean, your growth figures for 2020 are mind boggling, if I might say. Uh, yeah. Let me also ask viewers, uh, what kinds of robots would you be comfortable using as a consumer? And I'd love to hear from anyone who is uh, watching us. 
uh, Rajiv, in India, what has been your experience? Uh, where is there, uh, you know, uh, a lot of acceptance of robots, and for what kind of professions, and for which is there some hesitation? Yeah, no, it's a it's a very good question, uh, you know. And I'll I'll take you back when we were thinking of entering into the robotic uh, field way back in 2011. We found that the industrial robots, uh, you know, were a different category altogether. And you know, I don't define uh, a robotic arm as a true robot uh, because a robot essentially should be almost like a human being, where like a human being moves around. Uh, you know, has its own energy, has its own thinking, uh, you know, ability, unlike a tree, which is sedentary, but also a living being. A robotic arm is like a tree, you know, and a robot which moves around is a true robot, you know, without wires, etc. So uh, at that time, industrial robots of that kind were there, but they were mostly in the logistics side rather than in manufacturing side. And it was a different ball game altogether. We said we will be in the service robots and we'll cater to the residential sector first. And when we started to analyze uh, this market, we found that in a home, uh, basically the housewife, the biggest chore used to be the, the floor cleaning, you know, and uh, so that was the ideal, uh, you know, product. And one of the reasons why it has taken off today is also because, you know, people who are stuck at home, they realize that the most important task in a home is home cleaning or the floor cleaning and which is the task which they don't want to do the topmost is also home cleaning or floor cleaning and that is one of the reasons why it, today suddenly you know it took a pandemic when you know your housemates can't come and you know with everybody is in the home you know you don't have the 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 what do you say luxury of the cleaning the home at your own pace so suddenly the robots have uh, really taken up and uh, so window cleaning uh, you know also was a logical extension for high rise apartments then uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, floor cleaning uh, i mean the lawn mowing robots uh, was also a logical extension for high net worth individuals and then came the pool cleaning again for high net worth individuals because we were focusing on that category and when demonetization and GST happened and the sales went through, we analyzed, you know, that almost 45, 46 percent of our customers were double product owners or triple product owners of ours. So we realized, OK, this is a market which is there, but it is it has a temporary, uh, you know, uh, blip. Where do we concentrate on the uh, B2B side of things? And we we started to analyze and we found the hospitality industry as an ideal, uh, you know, industry because a housekeeping uh, you know department will be able to save 30 40 percent time with our window and floor cleaning robots the pool cleaning uh, department will be able to see, save almost 70 to 80 percent of their time and manpower if they use our pool robots and the payback periods will be less than three months or you know maybe three to four months uh, lawn robots also 70 to 80 percent of the manpower will be saved so suddenly you know when when uh, we were almost throwing in the towel hospitality industry came to our rescue and today we have almost 300 400 uh, you know installations of our pool robots across the country it is the biggest uh, you know hit in the hospitality industry then logically yeah. facility management industry like jll cbre uh, you know cap uh, i mean cushman wakefield uh, sodexo uh, 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 cbre jll cushman wakefield sodexo you know these are west corporation yeah. uh, Past. these are the companies which have to maintain you know the facilities in the offices and uh, hotels etc so they they were very successful and then they only started to demand from us you know disinfection robots humanoid robots uh, housewives started to demand uh, you know a back massaging robot you know for their lower <laughs> back and then you know sounds good <laughs> spending the uh, uh, but now with the pandemic, I feel that, you know, everywhere, whether it is industries, uh, whether it is airports, whether it is museums, whether it is showrooms, uh, you know, whether it is the normal receptions of offices, you will find an increasing use of the robots. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to read some of the uh, comments we have coming in. Uh, Pankaj Gupta says, hi, great Rajiv uh, Ji and Shalini Ji, just please. My co-founders also here saying thanks for the conversation, Rajiv. 
Uh, Jyoti Berry says she follows your work and finds it a great journey. Gautam Roy says robotics in India is still in the industrial sector, however, with people spending more time at home. How do we see the consumer sector of robotics happening? What are the key innovations you're seeing in this sector? Uh, Manishi says it's simply superb work. Thank you, Manishi. Uh, Ness Saroja says nice, relevant topic. My question about robotics in India what is the ethical application of robots from where we first need to apply robotics to make humans more creative how in everyday life can each person use it so okay. one thing if you'd like to take a couple of these questions so, so basically two questions you know one is about the consumer sector and one is about the ethical use of uh, robots so let's talk about the consumer sector first so as i mentioned to you uh, you know our organization itself has grown in the consumer sector uh, by almost about 400 percent because what the industry which saved us today which is the hospitality industry is almost uh, you know it came to a standstill because of yeah. the pandemic you know the yeah. hotels were completely yeah. locked down yeah. our sales completely uh, are you know zero almost now yeah. again as the hotels are opening up they are coming back to us with new uh, you know demand but in the consumer sector the product which has really grown is the floor cleaning robots and uh, because swimming pools are still closed so swimming pool robots not much lawn robots not much because of the rainy season window cleaning robots yes but at a much lesser pace than the floor cleaning robots so floor cleaning robots if we compare if we see the last year market size it was only about 10000 units this year i had estimated that if you know the supply chain constraints don't exist maybe we will have almost a 3000 percent growth through about 3000 300000 you know robots uh, units being sold wow. in the space you know that was the estimation i don't think now it will happen because of the china india problem because a lot of components mm -hmm. still come from there uh, and june july was a very crucial month for bringing in components for diwali you know upsurge mm -hmm. and things like that yeah. so probably the growth will be much lesser but when we compare it with china the china robotic floor cleaning market is almost 3 million units and indian market mirrors uh, you know the china market 3 to 5 years you know down the line so it's the same thing happened in televisions or smart televisions smartphones uh, washing machines refrigerators so i believe that it it is going to be you know a massive uh, upsurge uh, now coming to the you know the the next uh, question which is uh, in terms of the ethical use of uh, robots no, it's a very, very good question. And, uh, you know, um, I, I remember that when we uh, first launched our IMAP 8.0, which was the first robot which could live map a, a consumer home, right? So obviously there were issues which were related to privacy. You know, are we capturing something which we should not capture? Whatever we are capturing, should we let it remain in the robot or should we actually give it to the mobile app right should we give it to the mobile app through the you know air which is uh, you know in a highly secure environment and just keep it at the at the level of uh, the user's mobile or should we store it somewhere uh, you know in the server so those questions came in and we actually designed an app where we did not ask for any right you know from the customer we just prompted in case the customer wanted to use fine if not he would not be able to store the, the maps, etc. And but we never uh, went in for a 3D uh, kind of uh, you know photography or uh, mapping. We just kept it at the floor level, 2D, you know, and uh, 2D also in kind of a graphical form, not in a recognizable form as to what exactly is the table, what exactly is the object which is there. So an object is almost like a stone or a leg of the product. So we we kept you know those kind of uh, things in mind same thing now uh, when we are in, we have entered into the humanoids and face recognition technology is a big uh, thing and companies want to use it for uh, face recognition uh, you know from the attendance perspective or when people are coming in or the hospitals want to use it for measuring the temperature of the the person who is coming in you know and you can have a thermoplegic camera you know, which actually makes it very difficult to recognize a person. But when you are doing it, uh, you know, for recognizing a person, whether he has temperature or not, 
obviously the purpose is lost in case you use it for the thermoplegic you yeah. know stuff so then you have to have an additional camera you need to have the monitoring where this person went because you know th there is uh, a protocol which a hospital has to establish so there are such challenges but industry is you know overcoming uh, them one by one standards are coming in you know in a country like the uk today there is a movement and certain laws which have been enacted that if robots are taking certain jobs then the accountability parameters which were there for human beings have to be also imposed on the robots which are taking their jobs and which is the right way you know and so you have regulatory framework which also kind of uh, you know tackles the, uh, the 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 ethical uh, you know responsibility which robots have and i think it's a fascinating uh, discussion and probably a whole subfield in its own right ethics yeah. in robotics ai because as as you said some of the uses of robots uh, you know be it for medical purposes security purposes uh, and many others will make them you know uh, will give them access to information that can be private personal and how is that information used is probably going to become a whole area of its own yeah, Rani, yeah. One question. Alexa, alexa or google home you know they're always yes. listening so <laughs> yeah 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 I think I lost you. Some signal issue. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> Got frozen out there for a moment. <laughs> so, yeah. Rajiv, one of the questions I have is that uh, you know a lot of what you spoke about uh, as the uses for robots, and I it completely makes sense that they're starting with you know the physical tasks that maybe uh, you know at a household level uh, you know they're inconvenient unless you have help. And certainly at a B two B level, hospitality, etc. You know, cleaning, pool cleaning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So largely physical, manual labor kind of roles, which perhaps are going to be one of the earliest to move to robots. Yeah. Uh, but as of course you know, uh, you know there is a rise in empathetic machines, and in some parts of the world. Uh, they're going to be a very important part of the caregiving business as a whole. So um, Japan, of course, uh, with an aging population, has been planning for this for the last several years. And year on year, the acceptance of robots as caregivers for the elderly goes up. So in a recent study by Nippon, uh, some 84% of Japanese uh, respondents spoke about how they were quite comfortable with the idea of robotic caregivers, partly because you know, they feel a little uncomfortable imposing on humans, uh, and partly because it's just much easier as a relationship to manage. So wondering what are your thoughts around the empathetic machines? Uh, and their future in India? It's a it's a great question, and I think one of the biggest challenges for the robotics industry. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, empathy is not just uh, uh, you know something which gets uh, shown or conveyed by speech mm -hmm. or expressions, uh, you know, or by certain physical actions. Uh, you know, which are visible to others. There is a visceral, uh, you know, aspect to empathy, uh, which is uh, a vis visceral as well as nervous, you know, aspect to uh, empathy. Yeah. So uh, if suppose the two of us are talking and I have said something which is not to your liking, uh, you know, yeah. so uh, if one is I, I can can see some expressions on your face, you know, or a fleeting expression in your eye, which may, may go in a fraction of a second. But my eye has the ability to see that expression. And then what I do with it mm -hmm. is depends on me. But if I have trained myself, I would also be able to see if there is any tear rising up inside your body, which, which will take maybe three minutes or four minutes to come to mm -hmm. your eyes. That's empathy, right? But when we look at a robot uh, today, you know, even the Sophia, which you talk about, uh, how does the Sophia work? You know, when Sophia is speaking, its mic is off. 
so when when sophia is speaking it cannot hear itself also right because it is it if it hears itself its mind will get confused because it has heard you now it has switched off its mind now it has kind of you know whatever it has been trained to do or whatever script has been written at the back end it is drawing from that and expressing in the meanwhile you you try to stop uh, sophia sophia will not stop right it will continue to say something or whatever but now the motors the actuators everything has been done in such a way that the lip will move in a way the nostril mm -hmm. will move in a particular way some muscle on the cheek the mus you know some lines on the on the forehead will come the ears will move the eyes will move so those are all uh, you know uh, a ca capturing of certain parameters and then replicating them with a certain script right so why it may in a in a scripted situation a sophia may come across as very empathetic but in reality it is not empathetic because somebody is controlling it and if the script goes off then uh, you know certain expressions will be you will find them very strange let's go to japan you know and let's talk of paro the seal you know which has been found to give dramatic effects to the depressed patients right mm -hmm. now why is it that people find paro very useful paro doesn't speak paro is very cuddly you know pa paro makes certain noises almost like a baby you know as if the baby needs you you know but the baby won't react to you so a, a mentally depressed patient what does he or she want they want someone who won't react they want someone who will not judge they want a touch and feel and a you know cuddling to them where they feel you know wanted desired without any conditions attached right mm -hmm. so paro is something which gives that feeling but is not interacting with them now whether we should call paro an empathetic robot or not depends upon us but paro mm -hmm. by you know by its ability is not empathetic i feel that empathy is one of the greatest challenges which robotics industry faces you know otherwise we robots can fake very well the expressions of empathy you know but actually they may not be empathetic right so so I, I, being from the robotics industry i am saying this because i have watched this thing very very carefully and very closely uh, uh, maybe a time will come that we will be able to do it but please remember that scientists till today haven't been able to figure out the number of layers which the nervous system a human nervous system has right so uh, you know when we haven't even figured out what we have in terms of neural networks how do we replicate it in a robot i think it is quite some time away but if you really want to see what an empathetic robot can be i would recommend to you as well as the audience a wonderful movie called the bicentennial man you know and it is a robin williams movie it is you know it carries on for almost about four generations and how a robot's quest to die as a human is captured in that movie is simply awesome so please if you get yeah. and get a chance to see that movie yeah it's on my list now yeah. <laughs> but you know yeah. actually like uh all of us in the last few years we've gotten used to say speaking with our alexa or a siri or you know whatever else system you might have uh, and you know the recent uh, you know sundar pichai when he unveiled the google assistant and we saw that ai make his appointment i think it was for a hairdresser uh, not just did it sound extremely natural but it was Uh, you know operating at the level of a very highly social skilled person not even all human beings mm -hmm. can be as mm -hmm. fluent and as charming as mm -hmm. uh, you know that assistant was uh, so I i'm wondering if you think that uh, you know we are actually getting very very close and when the day comes uh, their speech is not just going to be what the average human speech will be like but it will 
they will sound like very socially skilled human beings. Uh, wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. So very, very good, uh, you know, uh, question again. <clears throat> uh, there are two parts to a human being, hardware and software. And there are two parts to a machine, which is hardware and software. When human beings think uh, emotionally or empathetically, what happens is those thoughts have the power to change our hardware also, right? Sure. Which is maybe even the muscles, the ligaments yeah. and things like that. In a machine, when it thinks, it is not actually thinking. It is actually drawing from certain scripts which have been written for it, right? And the higher the number of alternatives which you give to that machine to read, the more, uh, you know, uh, ability it will demonstrate to in terms of more voice modulation or, you know, number of different ways of answering a question, right? So th that it's about the script. Now, the moment you put that script on a machine, which has also got to change a lot of expressions and it has to happen simultaneously, you know, yeah. you will you will find it very difficult to replicate. Software is still easier. One to one is still easier. But then when multiple things are happening in a store, for example, and if five people are speaking, Simultaneously to a robot, mm. the robot will suddenly not be able to handle that kind of mm. stuff. Even the walking, if you see, you know, the Asimo robot, which is one yeah. of the most advanced, okay, or if you yeah. look, at, look at Sophia itself, you know, all these bipeds, the the knees are slightly bent, right? right. But the way God has designed us, we are able to stand erect. Of course, it took it God a lot, you know, billions of years to, <laughs> you know. Also. So, it, so the journey is, is still, uh, you know, happening. Software is easier to tackle. Okay. But when this software has to, I mean, easier means easier on a very high grade of, right. you know, easiness, but it is still easier, uh, you know, versus the, the tackling and the matching of the hardware and software. The right. real challenge is, you know, how do you actually merge them, match them in, right. in the best uh, hardware possible? Do you think Sophia has done a lot for, uh, you know, increasing the visibility and maybe even acceptance of very human-like robots? You know, yes, Sophia has done a lot. You know, in terms of the, you know, the visibility, you know, about the people talking about it, uh, etc. Uh, you know, but if the initial Sophia, you know, when it was launched, it was only the upper torso. Right. Yes. If you see it carefully, so the bottom portion wasn't really built. Now slowly they're trying to build it, you know, and they're trying to train it. And uh, about two months ago, there was uh, a conversation of Sophia with the uh, with with a professor of psychology, you know, and, and it was it, it is a very interesting discussion mm -hmm. where the Sophia tells how Sophia thinks and acts, and this psychological professor tells how humans think and act and you will actually see the difference so hansen robotics has done a great job you know in terms of raising awareness of humanoids but humanoids to really come mainstream uh, and act seamlessly like human beings or become you know almost like a co-worker like a human co-worker are according to me at least five to six years away. five to six years okay i'm just going to read some of the comments. Uh, Niharika asks, do human, do robots have a humanistic aspect? Uh, they can't replace humans. The need of robots is vital everywhere. Uh, Munir, hi Munir, says, nice seeing two of my friends in great conversation. Uh, Gautam says, robotics will replace manual workers. What is your view on this when India is such a highly populated country? I'm sure this is a topic you get questions yeah. about all the time. So again, two, two comments, very, very good uh, comments. So first comment, uh, yeah, I think it was Niharika or somebody, you know, uh, in our organization, we always uh, talk about this, that robots can be almost human, but humans can never be robots, right? Because we have our own way of thinking. We will not just accept somebody to say, you know, 
come very quickly and we are on a phone call and we'll just dump the call, call and just go somewhere else our thinking is okay we'll tell to the other person okay you know somebody is calling me i will keep etc etc so there is a human decision making element which comes in at every every stage so robots can do certain things much more efficiently than the human beings but and they can be very close to human beings but they cannot replace human beings because the human beings have this aspect whether you call it consciousness whether you call it empathy or you, whether you call it you know the neural networks which are much much more advanced now coming to the second part you know uh, of the say, second question which is about robots replacing or uh, you know manual labor or uh, you know causing job losses you know i am just broadening the question a little bit uh, it's it's a great question but you know let's look at it from this perspective that there are so many homemakers in this country who have great capabilities you know to contribute to a nation's progress but what are they doing how is their time being utilized in the homes you know for domestic chores even in our own offices there are people who are capable you know but jobs are very limited already but what are they being used for menial tasks domestic chores office chores according to me if we can reskill our people if we can free the trapped human potential of this country to contribute to economic progress right and let the robots take care of the really menial mundane tasks it's a great thing to have right it's such a tough one rajiv because no, uh, no, i i i have come to that no, now now <laughs> in it so this is one aspect which i have given you second if suppose germany has to reclaim its manufacturing power of status from china how will it do it with very high cost manpower with aging manpower right with lot of new rules which are there for you know to to use the manpower etc obviously they'll use robotics if now come to china if china wants to protect its you know stranglehold over manufacturing it has to destroy its jobs today right to be able to prevent germany from reclaiming the competitiveness which which is there uh, with china if india in one side is germany one side is china if we have to say that we will reclaim our position we cannot do it with televisions and automobiles right unless automobiles are also like tesla kind of automobiles at the cutting edge of technology we have to deploy and use or employ and use we are you know virtual reality artificial intelligence deep learning we have to use uh, you know the robotics technology and the advancements in robotic technologies in electric vehicles in battery technology etc etc and we we have to invest in them that is how we will be able to not just become atmanirbhar but also make for the world right so this is one aspect now i'll take you back to when an electric electronic typewriter came everybody said typewriter typists will lose their job you know when the mobile phones came the exchanges will lose their job people who are working in the exchanges you know this will happen or that will that will happen but the the economy evolved the economy progress the quality of life of the people went up right we should never fear technology all progress in the world happens by adoption of technology if god had stopped at the making of the first pig you know humans would never have been born or been, been created so so we should not fear about this as a country if we are able to make and produce things in a competitive manner by usage of robotics the number of jobs and the economic growth which will happen which will far outpace the job losses which we will have of course there will be a turmoil today in every nook and corner of this country a person you know there are people who don't understand one word of english but they are designing and writing software it software for the people across the globe so the language of robotics is also like that so we should look at it positively not look at it as a threat and if there is a threat it is not your weakness and you know right now but if you ignore the threat it becomes your weakness if there is a threat do something about it and become a much stronger and a much more competitive country 
Rajiv, I completely agree with you on the fact that I don't think any country today has the choice. It's You can't wish away the uh, efficiencies provided by many technologies. And if you did, if you unilaterally decided you would not use them, then you know you would be lost in the back and beyond. So that's really not a option for any country, you know, uh, today. But at the same time, uh, you know, like you yourself said, right, that uh, you you say in the pools, you know, seven they can manage with much less manpower. I think 70, 80 percent. You said, you know, uh, could work could be done. So at least in the short term. And we don't know about whether in this industrial revolution, you know, what kinds of jobs are going to emerge. It's not as yet so clear whether people who have simply manual jobs will automatically be able to move to whatever is the new family of jobs being created. So at least in the short term, do you think that there is some reason for this question at least to be raised? Fair question? No, it is, it is a fair question, but you know, the answer is not uh, in terms of avoidance of this technology or adoption I, of this I agree. technology. I agree. Let's, let's look at, you know, a coal mine worker, you know, yeah. and we see yeah. coal mine accidents, you know, and Kala Pathar, a great movie, you yeah. know, if you remember of yeah, our I times. I remember actually. You know, don't we think, <laughs> or, or, or the sewage uh, workers, workers recently, right? Workers today, yeah, so, absolutely. So should, should the robotics technology not be adopted very yeah. quickly in these areas? Yes, right. Absolutely. Now, now there are a lot of coal miners who will lose their job. A lot of sewage workers who will lose their job. What is the society's responsibility? What is the government's responsibility to reskill them, right? Reskill them and not let them lose on the roads to become criminals or you know a social threat. So there is a responsibility of us as citizens, of us as responsible businesses, or the society at large, or the governments to to make uh, you know people safe their citizens safe and yet take care of them so answers are difficult but yeah. the answers have to be found to such yeah. such issues yeah i think you're absolutely right i think the answers are not going to be easy at all because it's not so simple uh, yeah. they have to be found it's not a question which anyone can avoid uh, yes. you know yeah. People like Bill Gates have said, OK, what about a tax on robotics just to slow things down? Of course, if your JST is 28 percent, I don't know what else to say. But, you know, is that a so I mean, it's a complex issue and it's not an issue which uh, any one person will be multiple parts of, uh, you know, any uh, country, the government, uh, people like yourself, think tanks uh, who will need to you know, find some of these answers too. And I, I also agree, avoidance is not the issue, but the threat does seem like a, it's it's a question which is an important one, you know, what will it mean for? Yeah, yeah. So I'll just take a few more questions. Uh, Vijay is saying, hi, great to see you, Rajiv, after a long time. Uh, he says, uh, wait, just a second. Ah, I'm taking your second question, Vijay. Um, Rajiv, what if AI ethics can be superior than humans? After all, humans have many cognitive biases. With real world use cases and applications defined, an emotionally intelligent AI can work to eliminate cognitive biases that are common to us. What are your thoughts? It's a good you know, question. Ethically, ethically, AI can definitely be you know, superior to uh, you know, humans, but whether Artificial intelligence is better than natural intelligence is the question which we, we should answer first, you know, so so the rules uh, which can be written by humans, you know, for robots are easier to write and as long as you strongly control them, right, so those they will those rules will be followed. But so were the rules made for humans at a certain point in time. So were the constitutions written, you know, so, so were so many, you know, aspects. Uh, but the moment you allow deep learning to happen, where the robot, uh, the software, you know, kind of starts to learn and decide on its own, at that point in time, you, you suddenly have to have, you know, certain standards, certain more rules, certain interceptions, you know, where, where, thinking doesn't go awry. You know, some of the experiment, mm -hmm. experiments of Microsoft themselves last year in terms of the chatbots and very quickly, 
people were able to force the the chatbot to almost become racist you know by by yeah. bombarding it with many questions so mm -hmm. rules can be written you know but the thing is till today it is the human beings which possess the highest form of intelligence and artificial intelligence is just starting to you know mirror or you know demonstrate abilities what humans have so let's not have too much of uh, you know expectation <laughs> your question is good initially yes we can it can it can appear to be better than humans <laughs> you know and the reason i'm laughing rajiv is that sometimes i'm not even so sure that's true <laughs> Uh, you know, and let me share this uh, uh, research on actually uh, robotic recruiters uh, for you know for job roles for shortlisting employees. And one of the most interesting aspects of this study was compared to human beings, robotic recruiters at, as interviewers did better. And you want to know why? Because the lack of cognitive biases. Uh, everybody's asked the same set of questions faithfully. And everybody's answers are truly used to, you know, map against a certain metric. So, you know, that was a really interesting study I, I, I came across. And when interviewees were asked about their experience and whether they enjoyed it, surprisingly, the vast number said they enjoyed the experience, uh, maybe even better than a human interviewer. And perhaps because that particular, you know, a robotic interviewer was uh, designed to be cheerful, um, put the other person at ease, you know, ask you, how was your day? How did you get here? You know, all the soft skills, which it's not essential all humans have. I mean, some have, but a lot don't. So, uh, you know, interviewees uh, felt it was a nice, positive experience. and. You know, so so I myself am not sure because you know humans also have such a wide range of responses, right? There are the super skilled, super empathetic human beings, and then there's the other extreme as much, you know, and the whole range in between. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so one yeah. of my questions then is uh, Rajiv, um, what do you think is going to be the impact of all of us working with robotic colleagues at some point or the other? See, it's first, it is quite some time away, you know, that human looking uh, colleagues, you know, which are actually robots or cobots uh, working with us. Uh, second is that if they achieve the similar kind of ability, right, uh, it will be no different like working with another coworker who is who has similar competence, lesser competence. Or higher competence. If a robot has higher competence than the human being, the human being will detest that robot. If it has similar competence and you know kind of similar uh, stuff which it, the robot is designed to do, you will relate with well with the robot. And when the robot has lesser competence than you know, or it's been designed in such a way, then obviously you know you will make fun of that robot or whatever, right? So it, it, it human beings have this great ability to look at things from their personal perspective right and also you know going back to your uh, you know research which you quoted about the about the robots being interviewed i mean the the, the people being interviewed by robots uh, you know in that so if suppose somebody comes to me and in fact, after this session, we have some interviews scheduled. So I, I, it was, you know, very topical for me. So the thing is, when some, what is the principle which I apply? When somebody is a fresher, that person only has certain attitude, which I look at the potential, and to judge that, I give some certain simulations, you know. And I look at the facial expressions, I look at their contributions, the family background, you know, et cetera, et cetera. When somebody is experienced, which I'm interviewing and five, 10 years of experience, I look at the track record because that person has had enough run. You know, a Sajin Tendulkar will be consistently consistent, you know, and even North Kamli will be consistently inconsistent, right? So you have, have a track record of somebody. So you look at the Record. So when you are, you have to look at the track record. Maybe a robot can do a good job, you know. But when you have to look at somebody's potential, how do you 
actually judge a potential it's there are a lot of other factors you know this uh, movie which i talked about there is this robot who has emotions like human beings and now he has to marry he look goes to a robotic lab and there is another you know female robot this female robot is very joyful and you know etc etc but she continues to be in the same mode all the time and after the after some time this robot which is like a human being says i don't want to have anything to do with this you know lady robot because she doesn't have the emotions or the you know ups and downs which a human being expresses so after some time you know you you, you know you will not be very happy with someone who doesn't demonstrate any ups and downs you know so vulnerability you know because of what life gives you is also a very interesting aspect of human beings which endears them you know to each other yeah yeah so, i give you i i think you're absolutely right i think you're absolutely right actually that um you know when we connect human to human it's uh, a much more complex experience uh, uh, you know the information we're receiving interpreting it's a much more complex phenomenon and also the fact that in human to human connects it's a vast range of economic of, of uh, emotional yeah. uh, you know the whole entire spectrum that you hope to have an opportunity to both express and receive um, yeah. but you know i i think maybe for some roles where you want people to be pleasant all the time you know maybe it will work actually quite well there like if yeah. you are you know uh, in a queue to get something stamped and you just have a one minute interaction two minute interaction you want that interaction to be smooth you want to you know it to be pleasant and it's much easier to do that obviously uh, i will tell you an incident which it happened in reality when 2012 we launched our robots and uh, there was a you know half page article done by nuna walia in the times of india you know and they called it the robotic buys you know and they they made a you know buy in the shop you know uh, shape of a human being with a with a jhadu in the hand you know but actually our robot was a small you know disc like a weighing machine but the person in punjab thought you know that the robotic buy will be almost like the way they have demonstrated <laughs> <laughs> so this person called me and you know i in fact called on the landline i i and i i happened to pick it up and he says in punjabi sir ji eh jehdi uh, robotic bai hai eh enu main apni kudi naal bhej deya ohdi shaadi hai agle mahine sab kuch kar degi oh batal bhi maan degi jutte vich chamka degi floor bhi kar degi <laughs> so when we think of robots you know the robot world sometimes we imagine everything to be in the form of a human being but robots are not in the you know they can do multiple jobs you know even as i am sitting so if i have a robotic uh, you know toy or a you know the gadget which comes and just polishes my shoes and goes away even as i am talking to you you know i will not be disturbed by my but my shoes will get polished you know so okay. robots will slowly be all pervasive but not necessarily you know that they'll be our colleagues or they'll look like human beings Uh, no the other thing actually i was going to say is you were right in your assessment of how humans would respond to robotic career, uh, robotic colleagues because uh, there's been research at uh, cornell to study mm -hmm. human and you know when you have human and robots working in a, in the same team what is how do they respond how do humans how do how would we respond and many mm -hmm. of the phenomenon you would expect with people to people you see the same with people to robots so for instance yeah. robots which respond uh, to work only when they are asked to compared to robots which are able to anticipate your needs so the yeah. first are considered lazy compared <laughs> to see it's like yeah. we give you know we yeah. project human emotions onto them uh, yeah. uh, so the you know the first set is considered lazier than the second set yeah. uh, and yeah. that's just because that's our way of you know our way of working with another be i don't even know one can't call it a being but another what do you say <laughs> another person whether human or not yeah. and similarly like uh, our feeling of competition so in teams where robots uh, performed much better than the human colleagues which i think it is possible to have for many situations uh, humans felt discouraged 
and yeah. uh, at the same time if robots in a team were programmed to be pleasant uh, even ended in their you know spirit humans also learn to drift off on on the humans as well so uh, from the early studies of you know yeah. how what happens in human to robotic interactions we're seeing that uh, i guess once uh, we get past the surprise and the uh, <laughs> the initial maybe yeah. experience of uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, then it becomes almost like the way we would judge another human being yeah, so i'm yeah, just going to sure. take the last few questions and i realize we are reaching the end of our time um see hari haran hi we are talking team working collaboration etc are the skills required the most how robots will handle this situation in a workplace especially when one person needs some support <laughs> so uh, you know again uh, it, most of the uh, robots will have to be customized uh, you know for a particular task mm -hmm. and uh, you know like while while human beings uh, feel that they are the greatest multitaskers but frankly speaking all the latest uh, you know research actually tells you that multitasking really doesn't work because at any point in time when you are doing two or three different jobs you are actually not realizing but you are either sub optimizing uh, you know one task or all the tasks or you are thinking that you have made a great decision but you may not have made a great decision <laughs> on the other stuff and also missed lot of important aspects so multitasking is a very you know uh, kind of uh, a subject which we should as human beings also look at so uh, robots designed to do a customized job you know and also saying that if your colleague needs xyz help they will have to be programmed that for that questions will have to be asked questions will have to be answered from the repository which this robot has at the back end right so so it is possible to do but the jobs will have to be well defined uh, for that particular robot and it will work in only those that domain so whether it is intellectual input or whether it is uh, you know uh, physical uh, help so if a robot and you are sitting together and you fall on the floor mm -hmm. a human being pick you up but if this robot which is standing next to you you know has not been programmed to pick you up you know and it has been only programmed to pick you up emotionally so it was doing a great job and you will feel you know that i have fallen down and now yeah. two minutes ago you were talking so nicely in a very empathetic manner and now i you know i have fallen <laughs> down it is not helping me so you have to really train it yeah. and make it for for, the, for that purpose yeah 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 i can completely see that actually even i can see that kind of shock that you were so empathetic yeah. earlier uh, kusum marker pandey said what i really appreciate about mr karwal is how he continually grows his electrolux achievements and now a totally new space um kusum marker says what is the progress on eliminating ai bias in recruitment i guess it's not this wouldn't be your area right no no but you can answer it shalini very well i think this is an area which a lot of work is happening and because it's a cause of great concern uh, yeah. one of the challenges of uh, ai is that all human biases uh, actually now get institutionalized because uh, you know after all uh, they learn from data sets which have very imperfect behaviors so that's it's a real challenge it actually even the fact that uh, all assistants i'm sure you're familiar with this controversy but all assistants so far alexa siri and the many many others uh, yeah. are all in a female voice yeah. so you know the fact is that uh, it plays to the idea of you know a female being associated with being an assistant it plays into that idea I, I know from a from a uh, you know manufacturer perspective, they probably found that people respond better to that voice because it feels more maybe friendly or nurturing. Or so I'm sure. I mean, there's enough consumer data to which drives the fact, but there's also the reality that you know there is a downside to it. That you know, if 
all yeah, the assistants, yeah. robotic assistants, I don't know, but AI assistants are going to be women, then somewhere deep inside, it's, you know, sort of reinforcing the idea that women are assistants and whatever you do. So that these yeah. are real challenges. What's hap what, what is happening is that in, in the pursuit of commerce, you know, we continue to uh, reinforce stereotypes, you know, yeah. the stereotype of a mother, the stereotype of a father, yeah. of a grandfather, of a girlfriend, yeah. of a wife, you know, yeah. uh, of a husband. So as long yeah. as humans continue to push the stereotypes, the biases to be taken away from whatever human beings create. Yes. Is yes. you know going to be yeah. all the more difficult? Yes, yes, absolutely. And I, I'm sure you're familiar with because in many parts of East Asia, uh, there are girlfriend robots. Yeah, know, yeah. Who are living by themselves, you know, yeah. their companions and more. So you know, there's yeah. this whole. Uh, I think. I think there's going to be a lot of thinking which will need to happen. Yeah. All this seems to be happening faster yeah. than maybe the ethics yeah. conversations and yeah. an understanding of the true impact. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. one last question, Rajiv, because I understand that we're at the end of our time. Uh, Vijay asks, how about robotic process automation? Doing most of the jobs like replying to emails, writing articles, sending an analysis of reports or meetings besides other hard edge technical jobs. So I think it is already happening and I think, uh, for example, you know, Google today, you know, when you get an email, it actually uh, says, shall I plot it on your calendar? It gives you templated answers, you know, go to LinkedIn, go to Facebook, you know, even Google will give you, uh, you know, uh, completion of sentences, automatically mm -hmm. subject gets uh, filled. So, you know, robotic process automation, especially on the software uh, side is, is happening big, big time. And uh, also now it is happening uh, in logistics in a big, big way. It is happening in, you know, facility management in a big way. It is happening in manufacturing in a, in a big way. Uh, so it is, it is an idea, you know, whose, whose time has come. There are challenges, uh, but you know, anything which is repetitive, in nature where too much of uh, you know variation from uh, the output uh, which comes across to the robot for decision making you know is 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 not involved you will see more and more uh, robotic process uh, automation actually coming in wherever there there are factors which are beyond the numerical and certain patterns it is there that you know human element uh, would come in but you will see massive uh, you know uh, adoption of robotic process automation almost every sphere of life even in india irrespective of the fact that we may fear job losses or whatever but the people now realize companies realize you know that if if they have to compete even a garment manufacturer will realize that if they have to compete with a vietnamese or a bangladeshi mm -hmm. organization you know with suddenly migrant workers going away you know lockdown really happening factories uh, you know a lot of laws imposed on the you know the the occupier of the factory that if somebody mm -hmm. uh, they themselves will be mm -hmm. penalized they'll say you know i'll much more adopt uh, a, a robot yeah. which will do and will not get affected by corona and obviously i'll be able to do my business also now these are these are exigencies you know mm -hmm. or requirements of the the business so you will see increasing usage everywhere and maybe temporarily some turmoil but it is also a chance for uh, the government as well as us as citizens or you know the younger generation to reskill ourselves looking at the opportunities and move to higher value added jobs thanks thanks rajiv i think one of the key things i'm taking from our conversation yeah. today is in india like everywhere else robotics is here uh, the numbers you've spoken about and the pent up demand uh, yeah. you spoke about is obviously just an indication of how from a business perspective and it might start in you know uh, in certain areas like you said you know uh, cleaning in particular and perhaps some of the hazardous ones you know maybe window cleaning uh, pool yeah. cleaning one hopes that in other hazardous uh, operations as well, you know, definitely sewage comes to mind, but you know, any of the others where human beings are still being used, 
so there would be you know adoption of that but it's likely to very quickly spread uh, both as the machines themselves become more sophisticated and capable of handling a wider variety and as perhaps people all of us get more comfortable with the idea of working alongside human beings uh, alongside robots uh, as part of our team so that's yeah. really the key point that i'm taking uh, away from this uh, rajiv um, thank, thank you. you so much for being on our show i really enjoyed it thank you for me thank you So I hope you really enjoyed that conversation with Rajiv. Uh, I think it was amazing. He is really a pioneer in the field of robots in India, and uh, obviously he's really at the cutting edge of insights into Indian consumer behavior and some of the unique challenges we have in our country, where there's still a lot of anxiety around what this is going to mean for job loss. Now, next week our conversation is going to be on Thursday. we have the associate partner of strategizers uk office uh, mr tendai wiki also the author of the book pirates in the navy coming to speak to us on the challenges of being an entrepreneur so do join us uh, at noon next week on thursday um, and as usual replays of our conversation today can be seen on my linkedin profile or on our youtube channel and they'll be up on our website on monday so with that we come to the end of our show today i hope you had a great time and have a great rest of the weekend thank you and bye